Good afternoon, everyone. This is really weird. I'm used to being up here, but not in this capacity. My name's Robert Hewitt. I'm not Bill Camp. I'm filling in for the mayor, who is recovering from heart surgery and recovering very well, by the way. And I expect that he will be at the 4 o'clock event, which happens to be right across the street from his house. So uh, you can uh, listen to the real mayor at that time. Uh, but I did, I'm very, very pleased to be able to welcome you to this very exciting and wonderful event, uh, marking a, a milestone for both for your industry uh, and for our city. Um, and I, it's, it's kind of interesting, I, I see a lot of uh, friends and neighbors out there some people, I didn't have any idea of your connection with uh, Gary Kildall and DRI, um, but um, I guess that's what it means to say that it's a, it, this is a small world. Um, all I really want to say is I hope you have a wonderful afternoon enjoying all of these events today. Uh, and when you have some time, I hope you'll stop into one of our great shops and spend a little bit of money so that, <laughs> so that we can uh, stay solvent. Uh, but truly, enjoy your stay in Pacific Grove from uh, wherever you're from. Um, and uh, I'm so tempted to say, and is there any public comment? We will give you three minutes. And it has to <laughs> And um, I understand that uh, Mr. Rolander, my good friend and neighbor, is uh, wanting to find a seat, so I'm going to let him have mine. Have a great time, and congratulations to all of you. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Mayor Hewitt. My name is Brian Berg. I'm here representing uh, IEEE and the Acelmar Microcomputer Workshop. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my background is I was uh, chair of the local Santa Clara Valley section of the IEEE back in 2012. And I'm also the uh, milestone coordinator for region six within IEEE. I've been involved with other milestones in the past. I'm pleased to be here for several reasons. First of all, I love history. IEEE milestones celebrate history by recognizing an achievement in technology and bringing it to the public's attention. In addition, I've helped organize the Acelomar Microcomputer Workshop for 25 years now. And that workshop meant a lot to Gary Kildall. He attended most of those workshops during the years of 1975 through 1994, the last of those being just three months before he left this earth. Like myself, Gary made many friends and business contacts by way of that annual event. And the 40th workshop concluded just two hours ago. Many of those in attendance at this dedication were at this year's workshop. And also many inventions that we now take for granted were first discussed in an off-the-record fashion at that gathering. Just a few examples include some of the microprocessor architectures that are in common use today were first discussed at that workshop. And also they were inspired by other speakers at that workshop. Also some of the architecture for the silicon graphics workstations was first discussed there. Even things like the Furby toy had its inspiration from that workshop. The creator of the, of the Furby was, has been attending and was here this year. You want to put that up here? And <laughs> so anyway, um, I found out that Furby is the second most popular toy name in the world after Barbie. So a lot of that is due to the workshop. In the spirit of the Homebrew Computer Club, Asilomar is a gathering that's fostered friendships and collaborations. And so on behalf of the workshop, I salute the spirit that inspired Gary Kildall to great, create great things. I'm also pleased to be here because it's an honor to recognize Gary's technology inventions in what I feel is the ultimate fashion. And that's with an IEEE milestone. The fact is though, the milestone is not an award for Gary. The milestone is an echelon above that. It's a recognition of his inventions, and this recognition has been vetted by historians from around the world. This vetting process ensures that this recognition will be able to stand the test of time, and that will forever be seen as a foundation for that which comes after it. 
Just as Gary's inventions of CPM and BIOS were created by his resting on the shoulders of those who came before him, the way in which others rest on Gary's shoulders will forever be documented in this indisputable fashion with this milestone. I got to know the highly vetted process of getting a milestone approved when I was the champion for a milestone that honored the EE prom and the way it paved the way for flash memory. And that's a milestone that was dedicated two years ago at the Computer History Museum. I had the pleasure to work with SanDisk co-founder Eli Harari in that process. He's a holder of nearly 200 patents related to flash memory. And I got to look at many of the patents with him and to understand the process that went together to create that milestone, to, to vet that process, to show that that milestone would stand the test of time for what it represented. Because of that experience, I can very much appreciate the work that it took for David Laws to document the inventions of CPM and BIOS and to get this milestone approved by the IEEE History Committee. As such, I would like to invite up to the front here a few members of the IEEE, Eddie Oki, chair of the Santa Clara Valley section, Waylon Sue, who's chair of the Monterey Bay subsection, Tom Coughlin, Region 6 director-elect, as well as Howard Mickle over here, who's the IEEE president-elect. We'd like to present to David Laws an award. If you could come down, please, David. So I'd like to really see the presenter. Okay, so this is my lecture hall, right? So I'm a faculty in Naval Postgraduate School, so I'm just going to read out what's on the awards you David for all your hard work has been the past many months that we worked together on this. So it says, um, the Institute of Electrical and Electrical Trans Engineers, um, the Santa Clara Valley sections, and Monterey Bay subsections are pleased to present this certificate of appreciation to uh, David Law. Semiconductor Corridor, Computer History Museum, the recognitions and appreciations of your efforts in being the champion on organizing <coughs> the dedications event for the attribute milestone and the CMP, CPM Microcomputer Operating System 1974. <laughs> Thank you. I'd also like to recognize some of the guests who are with us here in the audience. First of all, I'm very pleased that Ted Hoff, co-inventor of the microprocessor, is here with us. Ted, could you stand up, please? <laughs> Ted joined Intel in 1968 as employee number 12. And he knew Gary Kildall well when Gary was developing the software that enabled Intel's microprocessors to power the personal computer revolution. Indeed, the citation of the plaque will be, that will be unveiled this afternoon includes the following sentence. Kildall's operating system allowed a microprocessor-based computer to communicate with a disk drive storage unit and provided an important foundation for the personal computer revolution. These are powerful words indeed. And they show how this milestone represents a feat that is foundational to the consumer electronics revolution that is part of the daily lives of billions of people around the world. Another co-inventor of the microprocessor who's here is Stan Mazur. Would Stan st stand, stand, stand up, please? <laughs> Stan has been on the Asilomar Microcomputer Workshop Committee with me since before I joined it. 
We also have Dick Ahrens, the local milestone coordinator who worked with David Laws in getting this milestone approved. Dick? We also have Paul Westling, IEEE Publicity Editor of the Bay Area. We're also pleased to have John Vardalis, Senior Historian of the IEEE History Center. I'm also pleased that we have, from the Naval Postgraduate School just down the street, Commander Staples, representing the Admiral's Office. And we also have Commander Martinson representing the Electrical Engineering Department. And just to emphasize, they are here because Gary Kildall was at the Naval Postgraduate School and much of his training and education and the inspiration for why we're all here today is because of the Naval Postgraduate School. So thank you very much, gentlemen. I'm sure I missed many of you in the audience and I apologize, but I thank you all for being here. IEEE is the world's largest professional association for the advancement of technology, and it has over 400,000 members worldwide. IEEE has sections around the world, and the Santa Clara and Monterey counties are part of the world's largest IEEE section, with about 13,000 members. We're pleased to have with us Howard Mickel, who flew in from the East Coast for this event, Howard is president-elect of the IEEE. He's an associate professor at the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth. His areas of interest include neural networks, artificial intelligence, sensor networks, and optical computing. He's a retired Air Force officer, having served as a pilot, engineer, engineering manager, and satellite launch director, including overseeing two US commercial satellite launches from the People's Republic of China. Howard. Thank you, Brian. Certainly. And so, as uh, Brian said, uh, IEEE is the world's largest technical professional society. Uh, we have about 40,000 members in 184 countries. Uh, we run about 1,300 conferences every year. We have 18 of the top highly cited journals in our fields of interest. And IEEE, though, is about advancing technology for humanity and recognizing those that have done so. And so the IEEE established the Milestone Program in 1983. It's about 30, 31 years. Uh, two weeks ago, past President Stecker dedicated the 138th Milestone in Osaka, Japan. Uh, I get to dedicate the 139th year. And in a couple of days, we have the 140th Milestone to be dedicated in Vancouver, Canada. It's truly a global program, as you can see. And we recognize a technical innovations and excellence for the benefit of humanity, and it could be products, services, seminal papers, or patents. Some of the history of the milestones, we recognize an 18th century milestone, Alexandra Volta's battery, 19th century, establishment of the transcontinental telegraph, the telephone, and Alexander Popov's work in wireless communications in Russia, 20th century, and the ACT computer, the transistor, and liquid crystal displays. And so these are truly, truly important works. And we don't let any old uh, event become a milestone. So as uh, Brian said, it's measured by the history committee. So first, it takes a local volunteer. So we have uh, Dick Ahrens and David Laws that made the hard work of research. Why was this significant? But then they had to convince the History Committee. Mm -hmm. And then the History Committee looked at it, as you said, not easily done, right? And then it goes to the IEEE Board of Directors. And every one of these milestones is approved individually and directly by the IEEE Board of Directors. We take the program very seriously. Right? Um, the History Center, actually in Stevens Tech, if you ever get a chance to get back to New Jersey, we just moved the History Center to Stevens Tech. It used to be at Rutgers. I encourage you to take a look and see at some of the history of our profession. Um, I'd like to say a little bit, a few words about this 139th milestone and significance as I see it. Right? And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to depart from my uh, prepared notes a little bit. I want to take you back 
Uh, the notes say uh, Gary did this work in 1973 and 1974. And I know I was an undergraduate student in 1973 and 1974. And we had a computer in the university. And you'd write your cards, punch cards, you bring them to the computer, right? Very few computers existed, right? There were these big things. And the companies that built these things, they wrote operating systems. And what was the purpose of the operating system then? It was to efficiently use the hardware. People were cheap. Right? And then people like Ted uh, invented the microprocessor. But where would we be if we just had the microprocessor? So a lot of technology went into this. And I think the key thing of this is Gary saw we need to have an operating system that is hardware agnostic. How did he do that? He came up with the BIOS, the concept of BIOS. So imagine uh, IBM taking their 360 mainframe and say, we're not going to build the operating system for this mainframe. We're going to build something that anybody can use. It wasn't going to happen, right? So this truly was a revolution. I think this is the significance, right? And then we talk about booting from a floppy disk. If you think back in 1973, 74, these mainframes had disks also in three, four, five thousand dollar cabinets, right? Um, and so we wanted to have something that was cheap and easy to use in a personal computer. So the whole revolution started, I think, but it wouldn't have been what it is without this linchpin of the operating system that Gary invented. And so he, he did this in 73, 74, I guess, was the first uh, working prototype. In uh, 76, he incorporated uh, Digital Research Inc. Uh, released program version 1.3. And so the milestone we're going to get, dedicate later this afternoon is going to be at the headquarters. Headquarters of a company from 1978 to 1991. And I think the other thing that I saw in my research is uh, talk about Gary and his work environment at DRI. It says, Gary fostered a work environment in which good creative people could set about the task of revolutionizing the world and enjoying themselves in the process. And I think that is the secret of innovation, to have good people empower them, have them let, have fun doing these things, and see the great things that happen. And we have a result of that. I think that's also part of Gary's truly innovative uh, contribution. Um, CPM, Control Program for Microprocessors, was the first commercial operating system to allow a microprocessor-based computer to interface with a disk storage drive, as I said, the floppy disk. Right? I remember when I was writing car programs, uh, we'd store many of the punch cards or paper tape. Right? So floppy disk, right? Um, I think these things also created the uh, atmosphere where hobbyists could generate and do things and create innovations. I think that really is significant. I think we see that in the whole technology came about from people, uh, as we talked in the car ride home, taking a few pieces from the uh, stock room because the company wanted you playing with these things at home because there were things that would develop from that. Right? And that was the environment that Gary had. Okay, but another quote says, but perhaps Gary's most profound contribution was his first successful open system architecture. We talked about that. He built an operating system. He, he captured the essentials of what an operating system was to allow you to use the hardware, but also in a user-friendly way right? on hardware agnostic platforms that you could then tell that operating system to operate on different hardware. That started the open system architecture revolution. Where would we be if we didn't have that? All the competition that it forced it, all the innovation that it created. This is the spirit of the American way, right? And this was, this was captured in this. So I'm, I'm pleased to be here to dedicate this milestone. And, and uh, I uh, turn it back to uh, Gary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harold. <laughs> I now have the pleasure of introducing you to the participants in a conversation that will enlighten you further about why we're all gathered here today. First, we have Gordon Eubanks over here in the blue. Gordon received his master's in computer science from the Naval Postgraduate School just down the road, and Gary Kildall was his thesis advisor. Gordon founded a company to commercialize the subject of his thesis, a basic language compiler for CPM. And that company was acquired by Gary's company also, Tom Rolander, to my left here, spent two years at Intel before joining fellow University of Washington alumnus Gary Kildall at Digital Research. 
Tom was VP of Engineering before co-founding Knowledge Set with Kildall in 1985. Now it was a company that created the first CD-ROM encyclopedia, really the very first title that was significant for the CD-ROM revolution and the multimedia revolution that started in 1985. I have a personal connection with Tom, which we discovered together some years ago at an Asilomar workshop. Our parents knew each other, and we were both born abroad by way of that connection. Tom in Kenya, myself in Japan. In addition, my, the first girl I dated in college was Tom's sister. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. We found that out in the back of the Asilomar workshop one evening. <laughs> in addition, David Laws, directly to my left, did the heavy lifting for this milestone. And that is more than just the 18 pounds of bronze that makes up that milestone plaque. <laughs> Besides getting the milestone approved, his work included coordinating today's events, securing digital research documents that are, and artifacts that are on display at the public library just a couple blocks from here, as well as setting up a successful Facebook page and many other tasks, not to mention all of us here in this room today. David has held senior positions, including CEO, at a number of well-known companies, such as Fairchild, AMD, Altera, and QuickLogic. I've known David for a few years by way of the Computer History Museum, where he is semiconductor curator. Without further ado, I now give you David Laws, Tom Rolander, and Gordon Eubanks. Well, thank you, Brian. I think you've used up my first three questions here. <laughs> <laughs> we'll think of something to say. Um, I've got up my background. I worked in Silicon Valley for about 40 years in a, quite a number of capacities, um, and uh, it was an exciting time. Transistors went from seven transistors on a chip. Uh, I think when I first joined Fairchild, and that was a challenge to do that. You could usually do it on Wednesdays, but you couldn't do it on Thursdays. <laughs> and uh, by the time... Uh, Ted Hoff got into the process of designing a microprocessor chips. I think, Ted, you put about 2,300 uh, tra transistors on that first uh, 4,004 wafer. Um, 2,200. Did I say 2,200? <laughs> Good. Um, today, on a day-in, day-out basis, many manufacturers throughout the world are putting 2 billion transistors on chips that are not much bigger than the ones we struggled with back in the 60s. So it's been an exciting ride. Met a lot of fascinating people. And uh, after I retired, I somehow stumbled into the Computer History Museum. I don't remember how that happened. Uh, spent some time there as a docent. Um, and then uh, we started up a group called the, the Semiconductor Special Interest Group, um, of which uh, the gentleman in the back in the blue shirt, Doug, followed me in one of my roles there um, as director of uh, that activity. And the role that uh, the special interest groups play at the museum is to help collect, preserve, and present the, the stories and uh, pioneers, uh, the important chips um, that help build the modern world we live in, for better or for worse. And uh, I became peripherally involved in a couple of milestone projects, right? the disk drive uh, down in downtown San Jose, uh, the project, big project that Dick worked on for the planar transistor that went into Mountain View, where Jean Hany came up with a process that we basically still use today uh, to manufacture chips. Um, and then uh, when Dick was looking uh, for some more feathers to put in his cap, there's, there's a lot of these milestones on the East Coast, big power stations and stuff like that. There aren't many out here. So, uh, we're going to fix that out, right? No. Good. <laughs> yes, and, we are. <laughs> <laughs> um, I said, well, I think there was something interesting going on just up the street from where I now live in Pacific Grove. Why don't I go check it out for you? Um, and uh, along the way, I met uh, Tom Rolander and other people in town and learned the story of Gary Kildall's development of CPM back in the early 70s. Um, started writing up a proposal, and I thought, well, I can wash my hands now, and someone else will take over. <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> that didn't happen. But uh, I'm glad you're all here today. Um, we, as we have visitors from uh, many different parts of both the industry and culture and, uh, and the world. And one name I would like to mention who didn't get into the introductions is Ed Lazowski. Ed, 
if you could uh, wave your hand here, who <laughs> Ed's a big time professor up at University of Washington um, in computer science. So appreciate you coming down for the day. Good to see you. Ed. And um, so I don't think this is the place to try to repeat the story of Gary Kildall. I think most of you are familiar with it. You've had the dates. He developed the technology back in 1973 or so, um, struggled with hardware to actually make it work, recruited another friend from the University of Washington, John Turow, who actually made the physical connection between uh, the floppy disk and uh, the microcomputer development system that had been loaned to him by Intel. And sometime in 1974, uh, they managed to get work. We haven't figured out the exact date yet. It was sometime in the fall. I spoke to John, and he just remembers that he and his wife went back to work in Chicago in the October. So it's sometime before October 1974 is the best date we can pin down. Uh, Gary took that, um, continued teaching at the Neville Postgraduate School, and uh, began to sell it as uh, almost a pastime established a company in 1976 and uh, had a thriving company here in Pacific Grove by the late 1970s, early 1980s. A tremendous number of innovations, a lot of uh, fascinating people went through the company, quite a few of them here with us today, and uh, two of them that I would like to talk to in a couple of minutes to get some background and some insight into uh, what were the real, what is the real legacy of Gary Kildo? And how did he contribute to f help to establish the foundations of the digital age that we all live in today? So, Tom, I think you probably met Gary before um, Gordon did. Yeah, yep. that was at college, right? That was in T college. Tell us a little bit about your background, how you became interested in the topic. and. Uh, um, I went to the University of Washington. Go dogs, Right, Ed? And uh, uh, one night, I was in the uh, electrical engineering department and uh, was just uh, uh, heading into an engineering career. I was uh, working at Fluke Manufacturing. They built digital voltmeters, and uh, they actually put me through grad school. Well, in 1972, in the summer, it was August. Uh, I came into the computer science lab late one evening. It was probably about 2 a.m. in the morning, sitting there doing my work, and in comes a guy with cutoffs on, freckles on his face, and he pulls out a leather briefcase, opens it up, and he plugs an ASR33 in there. Some of you know what that is, it's a teletype. And he plugged it in and he had a computer. I went absolutely nuts. I wanted to know where he got it. Apparently he got it from Ted Hoff over here. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to find out how I could invo get involved in that. And that was the beginning of my friendship with Gary. And you studied? Um so I studied at the University of Washington. I completed my master's in uh, double E, and I got recruited by Intel. So I came down to Intel in uh, late 75 and joined them for a few years. And I worked on uh, initially hardware. I was on the SB, part of the SBC team, uh, worked, and then moved into software, worked on RMX80, which is their multitasking executive. And during that time, of course, I ran into Gary again because Gary was writing the PLM compiler, which was the high-level language for us to use on the microprocessors, and I was one of his test subjects and one of his critics on PLM. And so I went through that QA process, and uh, he kept recruiting me, wanting me to come down to Pacific Grove. And I said, no, no, I'm having a good time here at Intel. I'm not really interested. I have no idea where Pacific Grove is. <laughs> Tell a bit more of that story in a minute. Uh, Gordon, you uh, also had an interesting interaction with Gary, I believe, in the early days at Naval Post Graduate School. We did, but most of that we can't talk about here. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Um, <laughs> we know. So um, I was a, a naval officer, uh, a nuclear submarine officer, and they sent me to get a master's in uh, computer science at MPS in 1975, and Gary's reputation at the school was the toughest guy to, toughest thesis person. So I went to his office and said, I want to do a thesis with you. He, of course, said he was too busy. Um, I said, I've checked, you have no thesis students. <laughs> true, true story. And. Um, 
So finally, he, um, he agreed, as long as I did something with these microprocessors. And uh, I'd worked for, Intel, uh, for IBM for a while uh, uh, during school and stuff, so I thought that all computers were big, the bigger the better. But he, so I agreed to work on this with Gary and, and did a thesis on, uh, there were three of these wire-wound boards, I believe. I think John Trode had one, and there were two others. One of them in the lab at the postgraduate school. These were just millions of blue wires on the disk controller. Um, there was one diagram of it, which was close to what was wired on the board. <laughs> did, not in, did not have any of the fixes that were necessary reflected in the diagram. So it managed to stay together. Uh, and and the, the floppy, the 8-inch floppy, was given by Intel. It was one of the floppies used for the endurance testing. You know, they, they'd run a, oh. so you tell you how good these floppies really were. Or maybe it was Sugar at one of their, anyway, someone had endurance tested and then Gary got it. So I, I worked with him there and uh, I just want to say that, you know, the thing that Gary did, there's a lot of things Gary did, but the one thing that I think doesn't get nearly enough recognition is he wrote PLM. I mean, this was a, a mind-boggling idea. He wrote it, by the way, in Fortran. Which is, <laughs> that is mind-boggling in itself. Um, <laughs> but um, he, uh, you know, this was a, he was a, you know, in the true Edison uh, heritage, he was a true inventor. I mean, he really did inventive and, and remarkable things. But anyway, PLM doesn't get mentioned. I guess that's because this is about CPM. But without PLM, there would have been no CPM. I, I, I really believe that's true. We argue how much yeah. was written in yeah. PLM, yeah. but um, anyway. Interesting insight. I understand that um, the topic that uh, he wanted you to work on, something about a word processor, and you chose oh, not to uh, yeah. choose that one. That was an interesting story there, sure. One of the many times I should have listened to Gary. He said, well, why don't you write a word processor for microprocessors? I, I couldn't see the value of that, because uh, Unix had Ed, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, and, and even had one that would format and you know as long as you backed up enough that when it crashed you could recover but yeah he thought that would be a great opportunity I wish I'd listened to him uh, but anyway it was and instead you you what was your thesis did, uh, did I, you I wrote a, a basic interpreter called basic e and then I uh, uh, converted it into a commercial product called C basic and this is a long time ago, but <laughs> I still have the source code if anyone's interested. <laughs> it was all written in PLM. Too. You could donate it to the computer donate history to the museum. museum. I tried. They didn't want it. Uh. <laughs> you, you've got an in You, you, right you didn't speak to the right people. <laughs> I, I also have one of the first Osbournes. There was oh, eight uh, Osbournes made with metal cases. That is that happy. right? That, that might be special. I know there's a lot of Osbournes, but I don't think we've got many metal cases. But, uh, uh, so, Tom, tell me about your recruiting process. Uh, the recruiting. Gary was a truly unique recruiter. I had known him uh, at that point for, I guess, about uh, six or seven years. He'd been calling me a number of times to come down and join him. And I finally got to the place where I realized, okay, it's, it's time to go down and at least have a look. And maybe Gary would leave me alone if if I just came down. So I came down to Pacific Grove. Well, actually, what happened then was Gary said, okay, great, you're going to come down to see us. Well, can you start on Monday? I, was, I, I, said, I said, no, I, I really want a proper interview. So I came down on a Friday afternoon, and it was one of those Chamber of Commerce days, just beautiful. I came into Monterey. This is before the aquarium was here. Drove along the waterfront. Oh, my God. My thinking is, you mean I can live in Pacific Grove and write software? That was a, a pretty good opener. So I came into the Victorian, you're going to see where the plaque is. And Gary's office was on the second floor in the front corner. He had the, the master bedroom up in that corner, and that was where his desk and his computers were. So I came up to his desk, and uh, on top of his desk was an airplane model. I was kind of curious about that, because I, I looked at it and I said, so what's with the Cherokee 180? And he says, oh, are you a pilot? And I said, of course. <laughs> and he said, ah, are you current in type? Which means, could I you know, get in the airplane right now and fly it legally with my license? And I said, of course. 
<laughs> At that point, he said, well, let's go. So we got out of the <laughs> office. We went down to his Porsche, drove out to the airport, climbed in the airplane. He put a hood on. You see, Gary had just got his instrument rating a few weeks before I came down there. And I was his safety pilot. <laughs> you, you have to fly every, you know, an hour a month, you know, several approaches to keep current. And so that, I think, was how I really got the job, was I was Gary's <laughs> safety pilot. Today, in cars, we call them carpool dummies. In flying, we call them safety pilots. So that's how I got started. And in fact, I did start working for Gary the next week. <laughs> Unique interview, Tom. <laughs> when did you first become aware of uh, CPM, Gordon? What was your idea behind, was this going to be a useful thing? Well, I first, got in, I first heard about it was when Gary said, there's a computer you're going to use to write your thesis. Um, Gary also taught an operating system class where he actually passed out the source code, and we studied CPM in great detail. Um, and, and I've looked for these notes, but, uh, but I can't seem to find them um, amongst all my, well, I have all my own code. But uh, anyway, so that's how I first heard about it. Um, you know, it, it's hard to go back to 1976 and realize the incredible feeling of, um, of the power of being able to sit there at your own computer and put in a disk and boot it up and, and see that A prompt. I mean, I guess that's what some of these drugs do. I, you know. <laughs> but um, I, I only heard. But um, I, I think, uh, I, I really think that that, that that changed my life to see that. So, I mean, it really, um, it really was uh, incredibly impactful. It, the, the, because you're at the postgraduate school where they had these, you know, almost armed guards and you only got so many submissions a day and rules and regulations and a bunch of other BS. And, um, <laughs> and here you had your own computer. Very mm. amazing. Did you have any sense that it would be useful beyond engineering, Gordon, in those days? Sure. I mean, I think everyone who was involved there really saw this as something that had tremendous future. Um, I, I spent a lot of time arguing with Gary about this, about whether or not this should be commercial, whether there was a real market. Um, you know. Was Gary convinced there was, it was not? Um, I think Gary was convinced there was. I mean, he tried it, and it certainly was very successful. Changing the world ideas, you know, they're not really obvious. I mean, I, I, the first microprocessor, I'm aw in awe to be in the same room with someone who did that. I mean, there must have been skeptics when someone said we're going to put hundreds of transistors on a single piece of silicon. I'm, I'm just, it's those kind of things. Sure. So Gary was one of those people. That, so when you joined, um, <coughs> excuse me, digital research, Tom, what was your first assignment? It was. A new generation of the operating yeah, system? Yeah, um, when Gary recruited me and brought me down to uh, digital research, I think was one of the, uh, I think it illustrates one of the things that Gary did, at least to me, a, as a mentor. And what I credit Gary with was being actually an architect. Gary uh, always wanted to look at the big picture. So when I look back at the process of CPM, Gary was convinced it was going to grow into, uh, you know, uh, higher, uh, more powerful processors. Those were going to lead themselves to multitasking, to multiprogramming, and also to networking. So when Gary was designing the architecture of that system, he wanted to make sure that each piece was going in the right direction. And the way he explained it to me was that at an early stage when you're making decisions, if you're doing a fairly small project, there become some sort of arbitrary decisions that you make. And it's almost a coin toss in some cases, what sort of algorithm to use, or, or et cetera. And what he did is he said, what you need to do is make that decision based on where you're going. And it's no longer an arbitrary decision because it gets you closer to that ultimate goal. So that was one of the things that I learned from Gary in mentoring. So he brought me on to actually be the architect and, and creator of his multitasking system. And then later his networking system. We had the token ring network at that time. 
And the element that he really watched carefully during that was my, how I designed and worked with the BIOS level. So in the multitasking world, we had something called an XIOS, extended IO system. And that had to deal with differences in interrupt architecture, differences in the way the timer worked. And so I had to come up with a method to generalize, to make those elements general so that they could work on anybody's computer. And the same thing when we got to networking. We had to work with uh, you know, token ring, and then as Ethernet evolved, work with that. So we had to then build that, that layer between the hardware and the software in a way that was agnostic. So that was uh, part of Gary's tutoring or mentoring. The other day when we were trying to identify some of the most critical, critically important aspects of CPM, um, we've mentioned BIOS a number of times, but uh, Gordon, you came up with something that I'm, I'm a transistor guy, I'm not sure I understand this, but uh, dynamic relocation of the OS. Can you tell us what that is and why it was important? I think Tom and I kind of disagree on this. I think BIOS is already in use on mainframes and many computers because they, the, people knew they had to uh, improve the hardware and they needed a, a smooth interface. We can disagree. They're yeah. both very important. But what Gary did that was, mi I'm sorry to keep saying mind boggling, but I remember the day at the school, he came bouncing into the lab and he said, I have figured out how to relocate. He took advantage of the fact that the only byte was always going to be the high order byte. And so he created a bitmap. And, and what this meant was it didn't matter how much memory the computer had, the operating system could always be moved into the high memory. Therefore, you could commercialize this. This is really nerdy stuff, but you could commercialize <laughs> it on machines of different amounts of memory, which, which was really, if you think about it, you couldn't be selling a 64K CPM and a 47K CPM. It would just be uh, ridiculous to have to hard compile in the addresses. So Gary figured this out one night, um, probably in the middle of the night, thinking about some coding thing. And, and this really made CPM possible to commercialize. I, I really think that without that relocation, it would have been a, a very tough problem. So to get people to buy it, it would be seem complicated to them. And if you got a new, added more memory, you'd have to go get a different operating system. Does that make sense? I think I understood the first three words. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't, know, don't Intel, you, for reasons I, I don't, don't understand, do had the, <laughs> the bytes reversed, right, for the memory addresses. The, and, uh, but they were always in the same place. The, yeah. So you could relocate it on a 256 byte boundary, to, to be precise. You could therefore always relocate it with just a bitmap of where those, never mind. Um, <laughs> Uh, hey, we hear you. <laughs> Certainly the most eloquent explanation I've ever had of dynamic relocation. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. I barely graduated. <laughs> <laughs> Do I get a rebuttal? Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, you get to rebut. I mean, you're going to tell us the importance of BIOS? Is, is that what Well, I think it's actually more than the BIOS because uh, what the BIOS really did, it really, Gary's operating system with, or environment was layered. You had the physical I.O. system. You had then the, the basic disk operating system, and above that you had something we affectionately called the TPA, which was a transient program area. That's where the word processing and spreadsheets and other applications went, or were running. And this particular architecture, what it meant is that you could have one, remember back to the silk boxes that came out with PCs, you know, there'd be a silk box for your word processor and a silk box for your spreadsheet and whatever. Well, could you imagine if you had to have a different box for each different piece of hardware, each different computer that was out there? That was really, uh, you know, the state before that time. And I think what Gary did is he enabled people to have that uh, scaling that they could sit there and prepare one software box that could run on all those machines. That, I think, was the truly unique contribution. And all of that was built on these two layers, the layer of the BIOS, which separated the hardware, and then the layer what we call the BDOS, which were the operating system calls that the application program would make. And in fact, we got really irate at digital research if people made calls all the way from the application down to the BIOS. That was a no-no, you know, that was a problem. It meant for us that those applications could not be ported necessarily from machine to machine. 
that was, I believe, the, the real BIOS contribution. You described um, Gary's approach to designing a, a new architecture or a new product to me the other day, the very fine drawings that he yeah. used to produce. Um, I mentioned earlier that Gary liked to approach a problem as an architect. When I look at what CPM's accomplishment was, and I mean, it really wasn't architecture, it was an open system architecture. Um, in fact, he made it, um, he did too good a job. He made it easy to copy CPM because he provided the architecture of the interface. This, these are the, the operating system calls from the application program. These are the parameters to pass. And so that was something that could be replicated because he did a really good job with that, uh, with that architecture. So that was um, the way you know, he did that design. And then he did these big drawings? And so, okay, the drawings. Um, when Gary did the, uh, I, I just wish I had them. I had one small one that's down here in the Pacific Grove Library. I only kept a copy of one of them. Those of you that have worked with computers in the early days, remember the big 12 by 18 with sprocket holes on them, printer paper. Gary would take you know, a, a whole bunch of those sheets, lay them either on a big table. He had a, at one point a, a door blank sitting on sawhorses that gave him enough working room. And he would draw the most beautiful pictures of his data structures. And he would stare at it. And he would sit there and stare at it for hours and get unhappy with it, rearrange it a little bit. But he did absolutely beautiful drawings. And when he, when he finished that, when he had the picture and was convinced those data structures were now correct, he would go into just an unbelievable manic coding mode. He would just go for uh, as many as 20 hours a day. I'm sure his kids appreciated, Scott and Christy, that he was just gone during these periods of time. Um, on a couple of those occasions, when he gets something running, the first time, which could be the middle of the night, and all of you have the written software and have seen that, for example, that A greater than the first time it comes up on the screen, you gotta tell somebody. And my wife Lori will tell you that I had a couple of those calls in the middle of the night. Logo was one example, uh, XLT86 was another, where he got it running the first time and he had to have somebody see it. So it didn't matter what time it was, he'd call me, I'd have to come over and see it running. <laughs> So Gordon, you wrote this uh, C, ba C Basic program, and you were, had your own business selling this. And uh, tell me how you came to join DRI. Um, well, they bought the company, so <laughs> <laughs> best way. Yeah, that was. A, it Didn't was you a take an interview, right? <laughs> well, right. I, I had a lot of equity, and I wanted to see what this was all about. Um, so no, I um, I was still in the Navy most of this time, and. Um, my mother ran the company down in uh, Sierra Madre, California. And um, then uh, once the IBM PC scenario was clear to digital research, in my great fortune, Gary, great, great fortune, he decided he ought to buy us because we were a language company and Microsoft had gotten a lot of progress on the uh, operating system front. So is that what you're asking? Anyway, Gary called and I came out and I was eager to come to Pacific Grove because I've been here at NPS, so I love <coughs> this area. And you stayed a couple of years at DRI before? Exactly you know? two years and then, then went up to Silicon Valley and got involved with what ended up to be a company called Symantec, which probably most people haven't heard of, but you've heard of Norton. <laughs> We, we bought Norton in 1990, so um, the, the company, not Peter. <laughs> what other products are there, you think, or concepts that best define the legacy of, of Gary? You went on to found another company? Yeah, I, I went uh, on. Uh, this, it's another. Uh, uh, this morning I was for a while at the Asilomar My Computer Workshop. And uh, Carl Helmers was there. He was the publisher of Byte Magazine. Those of you that are nerds will remember that magazine. I think, is Carl, is Carl here? here? Yeah. Yeah. There's Carl. All right, there? that's Carl. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, one thing I reflected on is that Gary passed away in 1994. And Scott and Christy asked me to lead the memorial ser service for him, which was held at the Naval Postgraduate School. 
And as I thought that through, I wanted, I needed some kind of prop to bring with me. And I thought about a floppy disk or maybe bringing a little one of the CPM computers along. And I finally settled on Byte Magazine. They had a headliner that said, toys, the world, or computers, the world's greatest toys. And I really resonated with that because one of the things that I think I learned from Gary is that what technologists do is they will always have the latest toys. It gets the mind going. It gets your uh, juices flowing to develop something new. Gary always had the first Walkman that came to town. In fact, he got the Walkman. He had one of those double earbuds, and I ran around the track with him in Pacific Grove because we had to try it out listening to his music, which was <laughs> some Western music. At any rate, so, and another example here is when the first CD player came out, the Discman. He heard about it, and it was only available in Japan. Well, he got a friend to ship him one from Japan. And I remember the evening he got that, and he brought me over to his house, sat down and looked, and he says, Tom, this is optical storage. You're going to fit hundreds of megabytes on this piece of plastic that's going to be replicated cheaper than a cassette tape. Day one, they manufacture the CD because a lot of manufacturing cost is time. And when you have to dub a tape, it has to run through. I don't care you know, how quickly, it still takes time to dub that tape. So with the CD, it's a stamping process. So it was cheap from day one. This was a publishing media. He said, Tom, we've got to get into this business. So that was, you know, it was toys. It was that kind of new idea. He always had the next newest thing, and he knew toys. If I, if I could add a couple sure. things. You, you know, Gary, as I said, was an inventor. He was inventive. He, he did things. It's easy to forget his PhD thesis proved that global flow analysis converges. Now, you'd have to know what that meant. If, <laughs> if you do, I feel sorry for you. But this is, <laughs> this is a fundamental idea in computer science, and I, I took a course, a summer course once from a guy named DeReamer and those guys up in Santa Cruz, and they, they talked about optimization for like a week, and then they put a slide up and said, Kildall's method, this, this, is the, this is the real story. Anyway, so he did that. I mean, that's something that no one ever thinks about. And before CD-ROMs, the laser discs. Remember oh, yeah. those? Pioneer, vi yeah. If anyone needs any, I have like 50 movies on laser discs. Um, <laughs> at least <laughs> at a good price. Yeah. Um, but he he took those laser discs and he did that thing. What was it called? He, had a, he had a Chiron character generator. No, but what was and the a BVH. What was the name of was it? It was Link. Was it? No, the. Uh, Rollers. Rollers. No, no. Yeah. Before that, um, with the. The guy in Carmel, the, the guy from the Monkees, right? Oh, well, Michael Nesman. Yeah, Michael he Nesman. did some. He yeah. he was he was constantly seeing new technology, um, and and in a way that was uh, I don't want to take your thunder. Are you going to talk about this? It's all been said. No, no he, he, he got. <laughs> and I think that's the yeah. thing that that, that gets yeah. lost. You don't have to worry about it Brian gets Ryan lost in all this so. stuff yeah. about IBM and all these other yeah. things. <clears throat> I think his thesis was very cool. Maybe we should need a copy of that, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I was going to say, after the CD-ROM and that, and uh, we sold that business, uh, Gary then started a company, Prometheus Light and Sound. And he was into really connected devices, in particular within the home, which is, of course, what Google and Nest is about at this point, I think, the reason for their acquisition. So he was consistently, you know, 10 maybe 20 years ahead of, in many cases, the commercial viability of a lot of those technologies. You know, I, th I think at this point what we'd like to do is that there are cards out on the seats. Um, if you have a question you'd like to ask any member of the panel, and if you could write the question on that, we'll collect those when the next two speakers are finished, and then uh, if we can have them answered here from, from the front. And uh, so at this point, let me see. Are you, Brian, are you going to introduce these gentlemen or am yes. I? Yes, I, I can do that. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I wanted to say a cu couple more words here. Uh, there's been some talk with regard to CD-ROM and optical storage. Uh, I, I got into optical storage in the mid-'80s, writing uh, device drivers and working with those devices. And uh, that's actually how I came to Asilomar. Uh, I had given a talk on uh, right once optical storage, and somebody heard me, and they invited me to come to Asilomar, and the rest is history. So, um, so I've got that connection with CDs, so it's, it's kind of funny that you know, we're talking about optical storage and, 
if you think back in the mid 80s, that was before the you know people were using the internet, or widely using the internet, I should say. And so the the big thing was to widely distribute lots of data, such as multimedia data. CD-ROM was the medium. So there was the optical disks, the video disks that were also discussed, but CD-ROM was what really made it. So um, Gary Kalel was on the leading edge of that and very much recognized it, as Tom just said. So I just wanted to say that that's just one other avenue in which Gary Kildall made an impact. So I think that's, that's pretty cool stuff. Yeah. So um, I'd like to recognize a couple of people I didn't mention earlier. Both Kristen and Scott Kildall, Gary's kids, are here. Would you mind standing up, please? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> whatever, kids, children. sorry, children, whatever, <laughs> Son and daughter. Son and daughter, that's better, thank you. Uh, uh, let's see, I believe, are there any other kill dolls in the, in the house? I think. My, my children are uh, outside. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Already. Great. And is by any chance, is Lee Felsenstein in the audience? Did he come along? I guess not. I mentioned earlier the Humber Computer Club. He was at the uh, some of our workshop earlier and just wanted to recognize him if possible. So we've got a, a couple more uh, gentlemen to, to uh, give some uh, thoughts here. We have Brian, Brian Halla over here on the left. Brian was Intel's interface to Gary Kildall when Gary first worked as a microprocessor software consultant at Intel. Brian also served as executive VP at LSI Logic as well as CEO at National Semiconductor. Brian. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I was watching CNBC yesterday, and, and they have this deal going to celebrate their anniversary where they recognize the 25 most influential and transformative people uh, on the planet. And yesterday it was uh, the, the chairman of HTC, this uh, Wang lady. And I thought, Gary should be at the top of the list. <laughs> and not just for CPM, but for all of the things that have already been mentioned. And by the way, I talked to Doug back there with the cameras and, and Dave that the Computer History Museum needs to have a Gary Kildall section right at the start of microprocessor-based computers. If you feel that way, send them letters. I, I absolutely believe that. Also, we sent word to the mayor that we need to have a banner across uh, Lighthouse, uh, <laughs> just like the one they have in Reno that says the biggest little city. And it needs to say, uh, home of Gary Kildall, uh, the father of the interconnected universe. Because he's really, he's been. So I was uh, uh, very, by the way, it's great to see Ted and, and Stan here, and it sure does bring back a lot of memories. Uh, I joined uh, Intel in 75, and one of my first uh, products in uh, the late 70s was a floppy disk system that we were getting ready to release. And uh, they told me about Gary and, and said that Gary had offered CPM in exchange for a development system. And, um, for the floppy disk based development system and we said well you know we're we didn't say it but uh, the engineers said that we're we've got isis and that's gonna that's gonna hang the moon out there so we turned down gary but gave him the development system anyway and my wife and i went down there to present it to him and and uh, one thing led to another gary and i became fast friends and i got to know gary as uh he had an incredible sense of humor uh, as it's already been said he he was the gadget guy uh, everything came out. He was the first one to have it. was the first time I ever saw one of these brick phones was yeah. when Gary, Gary, my phone rang and I picked it up and he says, Brian, it's Gary. Look out your window. And he was, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was the first guy to ever have one of these cassette based uh, uh, cameras instead of uh, the thing you, you hang around your, your waist. Um, I remember uh, Gary and I went to one of my daughter's uh, volleyball games in his Lamborghini and, and uh, a mass of students came and huddled around the car and one of the students asked if he was Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I gave, Gary, because he had a beautiful place right across the street from Pebble Beach, uh, decided he was going to take up the game of golf. So I gave him a set of my hand-me-down golf clubs. And he called me the night after his, his first venture with golf. And he said, Brian, these clubs don't work. And I said, <laughs> I said you, know, you know, Gary, we've all felt that way from time to time. I said, why don't you just have a couple lessons and, and get out and practice? And he says, no, they don't work. He says, they're right-handed clubs and I'm left-handed. <laughs> 
All right, uh, I don't know if uh, Ted and Stan remember this, but there were uh, some pretty dark days at Intel. Uh, uh, Tom was in the SBC group. I remember uh, there was a time when uh, the only design we could talk about was an SBC design with an 8086 that was uh, for an automated chicken plucking factory. <laughs> and they would literally hang the chicken by his little feet and they'd take him around a conveyor belt and chop off his head first and then dip the body in a bucket of lye to get the feathers off. And there was a bug in, I don't know if it was in our program or their program, where they skipped the step where they chopped off his little head. <laughs> and we had another design that was a traffic light controller. But fundamentally, and this is before the PC, um, we, uh, uh, there was a, a marketing guy for the 8086 by the name of Dane Elliott. I'm sure a lot he's, of you. He's in the room. Where's he's Dane? Would you stand up, please? Hey, Dane. All right. Dynamite. Right. <laughs> Dane, Dane was the best presenter I ever saw and, and knew more about the x86 architecture than anybody. And I remember uh, we, we got in the factory, we got a Twix. Now, I look around, a lot of you will remember uh, the Twix. Dane sent a Twix in, and, and I remember these words because it sent a chill throughout Intel. And the words were, uh, I've been out in the field for two weeks now. We're not only losing some of the designs to Motorola, we're losing all of the designs to Motorola. Did I get that right, Dane? Okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, that was a shockwave, and Intel rallied the troops. Uh, we got uh, all the marketing guys and the thinkers in the cafeteria and came up with, uh, we divided into teams. And, uh, but ultimately, the, the, the thought process was, what do we have that Motorola doesn't have? And that, of course, became, we have software. Intel has software. Intel has Gary Kildall. And so we, we came out with the theme of the crush, the now famous crush program in 1980 was the software crisis. And the software crisis was, I mean, it, I, I can hardly say this without chuckling, but uh, that there was going to be such a proliferation of uh, microprocessors that the university system would not be able to graduate enough software programmers to keep up with all the platforms. Therefore, it was important that people <laughs> stick with one platform where the supplier, Intel, was dedicated to making that software live from generation to generation. And of course they did that. And I think uh, it's no surprise or no secret that Intel did survive. But uh, that, was, that was Gary. And that, of course a PC came out of that design campaign as well. It wasn't because of the, the design campaign, but it was uh, being developed in Boca Raton along with a Motorola-based PC at the same time. And, uh, we sent an awful lot of guys to Tahiti as winners of that contest because all of them claimed uh, PC designs. There was about 200 PC clone makers. But that, that is something that uh, uh, I remember when I wrote the rebuttal to the uh, OBIT in the San Jose Mercury, one of the people that uh, sent me a letter thanking me for doing that was Andy Grove. And uh, the Intel clearly owed a lot to Gary Kildall and uh, maybe even, maybe even the, the company. Um, and of course, we've already talked about knowledge set and Gary's uh, uh, optical disc, and, and uh, I think, in addition to the Grawlier's encyclopedia, didn't he also put the 747 maintenance yeah, manual? Yeah, 757 yeah. and 767, yeah. the first maintenance manual. And uh, it's something nobody knows about Gary Kildall, uh, maybe even not his kids. Was one time I was over at his house, and he says, Brian, you got to come downstairs and see this, and we go down. He's got a Vax 11780 running in his house. <laughs> and he, sa he says, someday computers will generate animation. And he shows me the demo of a Coke bottle spinning around that is being generated by the computer. And uh, I asked him about that several months later, and he said uh, he sold it to a little company called Pixar. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, one of the things we did at Intel was uh, this thing called a wild card, and this was my last group at Intel. Uh, it's a PCXT on a credit card form factor using flip chip uh, and epoxy blob over the, the chip so we didn't have to package them. It had a CMOS uh, 8088 that we got from Oki and a 2010A combo chip from Faraday that had an 8087 math coprocessor socket. And the whole company fell in love with it, um, and uh, except for Andy Grove. <laughs> but Gary fell in love with it. 
And uh, uh, one night, uh, we, my wife and I were at a party at Gary's house. I think Tom Bruce was there as well. And, and Gary says, you've got to come and see this. He had taken the PCXD on a credit card with a belief that someday phones would be as smart as PCs. And he built the world's first smartphone. So Gary wasn't just a visionary and a dreamer. He was also a doer. He, he made everything that he believed in happen, uh, which is, to me, amazing. And uh, I think about it, uh, the first microcontroller assembler, high-level language, uh, microprocessor OS, the CD-ROM, uh, computer animation, the smartphone. Uh, Gary was a pioneer. He was a hero. I think he was a clear winner. Uh, I think he was the father of the connected universe, uh, and I hope all of us with uh, high-tech hearts will remember Gary forever. Just, uh, just before uh, John speaks, uh, we'd like to come along and collect any of those question cards, if anybody has them. So, you can get on one side, Brian, I'll get yes. on the other, and yes. we'll pick them up. You're an extra. Should I introduce myself? Sure. Okay. Um, hello. My name is John Wharton. Um, Can I introduce okay, you? Okay, sure. Yeah. I don't think it's that great. I just, just wanted to say a couple words about John before he spoke. John has served as Intel's technical liaison to digital research in 1980 to 81 and was a contractor to them in 82 to 86. He co authored several technical papers with Gary Kildall. I met John when I first attended the Asilomar workshop in 1987. He accepted my offer to join the organizing committee in 88. As program chair for the workshop, John is the man who does the magic, who turns all of the talk proposals, you can laugh, but it's true, turn all the talk proposals into a coherent program for each year's workshop. And that's no easy task. So I'm proud to introduce my friend, John Wharton. As to the programs, um, engineers like solving puzzles, and the more difficult the puzzle, the more fun it is to solve. And <laughs> trying to find 30 unrelated presentations and make it look like it was part of a planned program is a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, look, these three all relate to things with the letter B in the product name. Uh, <laughs> there's been a lot of discussion of the fact that Gary had been a professor at the Naval Postgraduate School, that he had taught such and such, always in the past tense, as though that had been a job that he held at one point in his career. The thing that always struck me about Gary, his entire life he was immersed in academia uh, from the time of a child. Um, the story of what happened before he rose to prominence is, is not told very often. His grandfather, Harold, had been a navigator in a merchant marine sailing back and forth from, I think, Tacoma to Hong Kong. Uh, when he decided to settle down, he formed a college for, a navigation college, which turned into a, a, a sailing college, nautical college. Uh, as that grew, his son, Joseph, I believe, um, joined in and became one of the, the faculty members. And Gary, as he was growing up then, was in a family where, where his father and his grandfather were both instructors at an institution of higher learning. He helped out when he could. Um, in high school, he was sometimes given the advanced mathematics classes to teach and was always struck that naval officers are sitting in their chairs learning from me how to do these advanced mathematical things. But the idea of being able to present information and sharing information and letting information out was something that he had learned from the very start of his life. Uh, so when he got out of high school, went to college, got the bachelor's degree, I think in math and computer science, uh, stayed on, was part of the first class of the first master, the first, the first time the University of Washington offered a master's degree in computer science, Gary was part of that first class. The first time the university offered a PhD degree in computer science, Gary was part of that class. As has been mentioned, he was very much into that world, writing the very early compilers and some of the, the um, theoretical optimization techniques that are in use to this day. Um, but he also had a chance working there to learn a whole lot about different types of computers, different architectures. The uh, mainframes were the only thing that was available then, but what makes this mainframe different from that mainframe? How do you move software between them? In what ways are they the same? Where are the differences that you need to watch out for? Because if you want to write a software and run it on five different computers, 
you don't want to have to start from scratch five times. And it's part of this architecture thing of seeing where you were headed before you started even the first step meant that each of those programs could be written in such a way that moving it to another platform later on, if that became necessary, would be trivial. All the things that needed to be changed were defined up front. You could make some minor changes, run it through a machine, and now you'd have you know, tripled the power of the software you developed because now it could run on any machine in campus. That was absolutely not typical at the time. It used to be that whatever software you ran had to be purchased from IBM or from Control Data or from some other company, and there was no prayer of ever getting it to run on anything else. Um, but he carried that uh, sensibility into the development of CPM. People talk about CPM as a product. I saw it, always saw it as a, a, an educational tool. It was almost as though that was something he was developing in order to use in his classes. It was mentioned that source code was circulated to the students to learn how it had been written. Um, my first exposure to him, this, this, there's been a lot of discussion of this uh, computer conference at the Asilomar grounds. When I was in grad school and came out to California to interview for a startup company that was about six years old at the time called Intel, my parents just prayed I wouldn't take that job because no company that small could ever last. <laughs> they wanted me to go to Texas and work for TI instead, but I, I, whatever. Um, as it happens, on my interview trip, the person who spotted me and interviewed me and demanded that I stay around and talk to other people was Tom Erlander. So he's literally the oldest person in the state, uh, the longest person I've, I've ever known. Um, but I did join Intel. I had been working about two years later. One day, Stan uh, Mazur advised me that we're going to a computer conference next week at, at the Asilomar Conference Grounds. And I followed along and went to the conference. There were a couple of presentations he wanted me to give. Um, but during one of the sessions, Somebody, something grabbed my arm and said, come with me. And I looked up, it was Tom Merlander pulling me out of the room. It wasn't like a, it wasn't a request or an advisory, it was just a, here's what's happening, John. And he dragged me down to a building at 801 Lighthouse, introduced me to some, I'm sorry. He, dragged, he took me to the building, which was the DRA headquarters, introduced me to Gary. And we probably spent two hours, and what Gary was doing was basically giving me a computer science lecture on the potential of microcomputers. I had worked at Intel for some years. I knew what these things were, and he opened my eyes because he was looking so far out beyond anything that Intel had conceived. Normally, when a new technology comes along, if you're designing the first car, you go at it step by step, and you keep improving the car, improving the car, and problems may arise later. The thing that Gary had going for him was that since he had gone through a full formal academic program, since he had a PhD in computer science, since he had taught at the postgraduate school, um, he had this sense of where this new industry was headed. Intel didn't know that. It's not clear Intel knew that the chips they were selling were even computer chips. Um, from their perspective, there were things like digital scales and traffic light controllers. In computer science, the formal education, you learn that there's a fundamental theorem that any th machine that has a bare minimum set of capabilities, the, the uh, computer scientist Alan Turing uh, hypothesized a theory which stood up. If you can do just a handful of instructions like addition and clearing and a conditional branch and loading and storing data or something, any computer with that bare minimum could do anything, including simulate the operation of any other computer you could define. And if you could simulate the other operation, then that could run any code that had been written for any of those other computers. And so what he was always intrigued by is the possibility of growing a market for the product, um, getting the simple, soft, the simple chips that were extremely primitive and getting them to run very, very sophisticated software. When he had been working at the University of, of Washington, he was uh, the person behind the counter who you submit your box of uh, punch cards too. The routine back then was that you would punch up some cards, spend hours getting it straight, give this box to some priest behind the uh, <laughs> curtain. The priest would carry them away and by morning when you went in it might be sitting out with a long list of errors and things that you have to fix so it's going to take another two days before you could spit that. Gary was the person that, that got the boxes and what he liked to do was any night when there wasn't like a terrible backlog, he put out a sign that said Machine down for maintenance. 
<laughs> and then spend the rest of the night playing at the console he, that made the uh, university's mainframe computer be his personal computer to play with and experiment with and discover just how productive somebody could be if they weren't breaking their work into discontinuous sections. If you could run a program, see the bug, change that and proceed and keep doing this iteratively, it was a tremendously productive and tremendously empowering and tremendous fun. Except you can't do that because not every citizen can own an $8 million IBM mainframe. When the first IBM, I'm sorry, when the first Intel microprocessor came out, what he saw was that with the right software, there's nothing this thing can't do. Uh, applying the Turing theorem. It might take a lot longer to do it if you're running a whole IBM mainframe and you run a program. It might end within half a second. Okay, so it might take four minutes or 15 minutes to finish if you have a very, very slow processor. But that's still an interactive process that makes people a lot more productive than they would have been otherwise. Uh, so part of that was his view, he already knew what the, the destination was, what the promised land was. He'd been using these computers very sophisticated machines to do very sophisticated things. And then when the Intel chip came out, what he saw was that this will grow to become that stuff. And the important thing is that we do it in steps, knowing what our target is, instead of just experimenting and trying things one step at a time. Um, the time that Tom Erlander grabbed me from the workshop and brought me back to 801 Lighthouse, introduced me to Gary. I didn't know quite what was going on, but Gary basically launched into a lecture about this potential and what could happen, and here's what the software has to be, and here's what the first generation will be, and here's what the second generation will be, and then we're going to have to worry about multi-programming, and at some point, remote connectivity is going to be important, so then we have uh, networked operating systems, but they all have to run the same software because you don't want to have to write new editors when you go from being this one thing on your desktop to something that's running on another system halfway across the country. And they'll become affordable. You can put multiple computers together. You can get them to cooperate. You can get them to communicate. You can get them to share memory. You can get them to pass messages back and forth and run multiple tasks. I mean, it was just this weird vision. I had never heard anything like that. Within Intel, the company that was making the chips, nobody knew that's where the industry was headed. Um, so what was fun then was sitting back, as he was teaching me about these things, he'd occasionally grab a reference manual and, and give it to me and say, there's a lot more here. He'd grab an eight and a half inch floppy disk and say, here, that's the utility. Here's the operating system. He was just, you know, a, a real corporation doesn't give stuff away to strangers. <laughs> they make their stuff by selling. But he was trying to share with me, I guess Tom told him, I don't know what Tom told him, but it seemed like what he was trying to do was he enjoyed teaching so much that I was a, a bright young pupil that he wanted to bring up to speed. He maybe knew that I was at Intel, maybe he figured the more disciples there were carrying in the message through the back doors, the, the sooner Intel would get the message. Um, but I walked away with an armful of hundreds of dollars worth of software and documentation and disks, uh, not quite knowing why, but as I went home and started reading all of this stuff, it was just fascinating because mostly when you get a computer software, the user's manual tells you how to do things. Here are the commands, here's the result. Gary's user's manuals always included philosophy. Here's what we're trying to do. Here's how it works. Here are the data structures. Here's why they have to be the way they are. Here's how they're going to be adapted. Here's the process that goes on in opening a disk file. You know, teaching a lecture, uh, a textbook, on how to do what it is that he did, and by the way, here's what he did, which you can use as a reference. But don't stop there. Here's how you change it. There's been discussion of this BIOS and what it made it remarkable. Um, in the old world of mainframe computers, if you bought a computer mainframe from IBM or from Control Data or any other vendor, what you would get is an integrated package. They would deliver it, hook it up, install it, set in the uh, cooling systems, give you all the software you needed, and that was it. You were at their mercy. If you needed something else, you would have to buy something else from them. Gary's view was that when we went from being large systems sold as a unit to individual chips being sold as a piece, there's no reason why people should be constrained by what some other manufacturer thought to offer them. Um, so his goal was to think that any computer built using this particular processor or another processor like it should be able to run all the software in the world at a minimum effort. So towards that end, the three, what this BIOS thing did, the basic I.O. system, was take a very complicated operating system and make sure that all of the I.O. operations 
conducted throughout the whole application, the utilities, everything funneled down to a very small number of entry points. I think there are maybe 13 routines. Things like, here's how you read a character from a keyboard. Here's how you write a character to a display. Here's how you specify a sector on a disk drive. Here's how you read that sector into memory. Here's how you write that sector into memory. And he would explain the work, and he would show, here's the source code we developed to do all that. And here's what was produced when that was assembled into the binary code. And here's how those binary locations are laid out on sectors 13 and 14. And here's what you'll see in terms of all the hex values. And say you're doing, trying to run a, build a computer or change a computer, and you're using a different mechanism for doing the output, then you have to change these two routines. And here's how you change them. You read in a sector, you poke in some slightly different values, you write it back out again. You now have a fully customized machine, which won't do everything quite yet, but will boot up the operating system, and it will run the edit utilities. So from there, now you can make additional changes to the other routines to do disk reads and writes, and, and bootstrap yourself up to the point where, uh, okay. well, that, that, that was a lot of fun for me to do. Uh, I got very interested. I arranged to become the liaison to the company. Um, and it just made sure that, not just that people knew what was going on, but it also made the industry a whole lot more competitive because computer manufacturers could change the components they were using, what to the fastest, most efficient things at each step, and instantly bring with them years and years of application programs made by hundreds and hundreds yeah. of vendors, and the whole system would move seamlessly from one generation to the next. I think that's uh, yeah, Thank you. Thank you, very, thank you very much, John. That was extremely enlightening. I, I had the task of uh, editing the transcript of the oral history that we did on the 8051. Was it, John? You made it tough. <laughs> Actually, it's very, very clear. Um, I thought we were going to get a demo of the Furby, though. Oh, uh, uh, we'd, we'd have to put the batteries back in. Oh, the uh, batteries are in there? Are you serious, David? Would you? I'm going to do it. It's we'll, we'll raining, do it. maybe later. We'll, we'll do see. It. <laughs> okay. A uh, few I'll questions we have up here. Um, when did Apple create the first Apple OS, and how did it differ from CPM? Gordon, can you uh, answer this one for us? Um, I'm not sure the exactly, but it was contemporary with CPM. I mean, the difference between the Apple II and the operating system and CPM was uh, CPM was a disk operating system, and, and Apple was really focused on sequential devices like tape. Um, I don't believe that in that, that period there were disks that, disk drives that originally with the Apple II. You, 79, right? Yeah, 77. It was a 77. They, they did an upgrade for the Apple II uh, at, a, at a board with a floppy disk controller, which actually was very interesting because it had, original ones had about 47 chips, and thanks to Steve Wozniak, it went down to about five chips because of the fancy software he wrote to run those five chips. Pretty amazing, actually. That's actually part of the substantiation for the Apple II milestone that will be dedicated in about a year. But it was really well, it was originally right. I mean, I think, I think the vision, though, of, of CPM was the disk operating system, the random access. It, it fundamentally changes what kind of software you can develop and, and what you can use it for. Um, again, it wasn't something that hadn't been done in big computers, but it was a real milestone to do it with a, an 8080. That, you know, when we talk about 86s, there aren't any 86s in these days. These were 8080s that dressed 64K. Yeah. Fairly slow. Okay, uh, uh, hopefully a short answer to the question here about the issue. Why didn't DRI immediately sue Microsoft for micro, uh, copyright infringement? I think Tom can cover that for us. Yeah, yeah I, uh, digital research didn't have a patent on CPM. Uh, we copyrighted uh, the API for the product. And uh, at that point in time, nobody had taken to court an API uh, you know, lawsuit. So that was that was very complex at that point. I think from Gary's uh, perspective, he was not litigious. He was more looking to the future. He was more interested in multitasking, moving on to the next generation. So he was less concerned about that uh, that interface and protecting it from uh, and pursuing a lawsuit. They also had a legal agreement with IBM, if we remember. That was that was part of. Yeah, the, he went to New York yeah. and. 
Sure. The tra and, and the agreement was that IBM would release the computer with no operating system, but the user could buy whichever one they wanted. Right, there were yeah. three of them. Yeah. And uh, of course, all the applications ran on Microsoft's operating yeah. system, but. And one other minor difference, and that was CPM was priced at $260 and PC-DOS at $40. So they let the market speak. Let me interrupt. I bought a PC, and of course, every case I know of, they threw in the operating system for free. It's a $40 value that we're giving to you for nothing at all. And it was always DOS. So oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Made it an easy sell. And I'm sorry for interrupting you, but... If you prefer to spend $260 for CPM, we do have that in our warehouses. Fill out one of these forms, prepay. <laughs> we'll send it on to the office. We usually set, send these out every month or so. In the meantime, here's a free copy of MS-DOS. Get started now, start developing software, do what you want. By the time you get the software you need, you'll be two months into this, and it will never make sense for you to suddenly stop and start from scratch because you've got what you need in Head Start. Another question wasn't the first name control program slash monitor, and I think that was correct. It was later changed to microcomputer, make it uh, more obvious what the applications were. How many companies did Gary start? I think we listed about five different companies, right? Uh, digital research, uh, ActiVenture right. became Active Knowledge Venture. Set. Right. Um, and Prometheus. Prometheus. Prometheus three, three, Light right? Sound. So yeah, there are three, three that we can three, identify yeah, there. Three. Mm -hmm. The, the first name of digital research was actually intergalactic digital research, a piece of trivia most of you probably know. But. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, can, for me, can you tell us about software plans and CHM and where CPM would fit? Uh, specifically about CPM, I don't know, I'm, I'm a chip guy, not a software guy, but there is a very big exhibit in development to, that is due to open I think when they finish run fundraising for it, it's called Make Software. And it's going to be about, Doug, about a seven or eight million dollar exhibit with yeah. some of the fundamental f app applications of software and how they uh, work in our lives. I know Photoshop is one of the examples that we used. So I think we're about out of time. Are we out of rain yet? No, it's no, still it's, raining. Uh, it's uh, lightening up a little bit slightly than it was at least. We, 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 I've got one other thought. Um, if, if we've got a, a few more minutes here, Scott, have you, have you, do you have your words with you right now? Maybe, um, in case some of you can't make it down to the uh, plaque because of the, the rain, uh, Scott Kildall has a few words that he's prepared to speak there. Maybe it's a good time to hear them now. So you're going to have to imagine that um, we're outside in front of the milestone and you guys are standing around in a circle and I'm not sitting here on the podium with everyone else. So this is more of a formal speech. But one thing that um, struck me is that there's been so much amazing um, stuff I've learned today about the history from, um, from Gordon and John and Tom that um, I never knew from talking to my dad or reading his memoirs. Um, so it's been personally really amazing. I'd also encourage you guys to um, take some active roles in Wikipedia. Right. Seriously, I've looked at his Wikipedia page many times, and a lot of this stuff's not in there, and it should be. <laughs> so, uh -oh. um, writing. Yeah. Um, my sister and I uh, co-wrote the speech, and um, we'd like to thank everyone for coming out here in person today to celebrate the dedication of the milestone. And I'm going to get a little bit emotional at a few points, so <laughs> forgive me, um, for our, our dad. And a special thanks to Tom Rolander, who's been a longtime family friend, and David Laws, who's been incredible, and everyone at IEEE for who I've just met today to do the legwork to honor Gary's legacy. Um, it's just an amazing experience to be back in the small town where we've grown up. Um, I have many childhood memories of eight inch floppy disks, um, <laughs> terminal computers, and the family of digital research employees. And you know, I grew up in digital research when I was eight, seven, eight years old, you know, and being surrounded by these machines. And it was just incredible to be, um, be there. We didn't know the significance at this time of my dad and, and uh, our mother, Dorothy McEwen, who was uh, his cohort in making digital research a reality and providing this amazing business atmosphere for his, uh, his employees. That this milestone, like every IEEE milestone, honors the inventor, a rare type of human. Uh, this is the person who creates something original rather than just finding something and marketing it. 
and finding the work of others that way. And this is someone who brings the new technology to share with the world, and as Gary's case is uh, driven by the spirit of creation rather than that of profit. With the dedication of this milestone, everyone that has ever preceded it, I think we have the opportunity today to redefine what success really means. Success means embracing invention. Gary saw what didn't yet exist and worked so very hard to make this vision happen. In 1974, as we all know here, people thought of the computers as toys. Or they hadn't even heard of computers, they thought of them as these giant things in, you know, ensconced in, in um, private companies. And when he wrote CPM, he envisioned this world where everyone would have a personal computer, and now we have them you know, on our desks, in our laptops, in our pockets. And this is only the beginning. Um, success means sharing ideas. Gary saw what, um, he, he would often sit down with a pen and paper, and I didn't even know that story about him you know, laying out this uh, door frame like style you know, with the giant diagrams, but I do remember the doodles that he always had. And he was always telling me, a seven-year-old kid, and diagramming things like the concept of infinity to like a seven-year-old kid. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> and he would um, share these ideas no matter what the cost. Um, and you have always want to start a lively conversation about coding or the CD-ROM with just about anyone. And I think Gary today would have been a huge supporter of today's open source culture. And um, that was just his nature. Um, success also means doing what you love. And Gary just loved his work. Uh, this attitude made his joy of ideas infectious to others. And I think there's a lot of people here at Digital Research, former Digital Research employees. Can I see hands up? And uh, Whoa. 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 yeah, many of whom now stand before us, maybe a little older, maybe a little grayer. <laughs> and that experience just changed so many lives. I mean, the provided products that help millions and millions, but all those people, all those Digital Research employees you see them here today, you know. 40 years later, after the mention of CPM, 20 years later after his death, and all those people have carried those, that legacy of Gary and his creative uh, juices, I'm totally going off script right now, uh, <laughs> into the future. I think many of us are just privileged to work with or you know, be related to or to know Gary and his work either personally or professionally. And um, I just hope that we can embrace this other type of definition of success, that we recognize, support, and embody this definition, definition of what success means, loving your work, being creative, and sharing it with others. And um, I can't help but um, think of how proud Gary was, our dad, of that moment in 1974. And this was, you know, I think we point to that pivotal moment, it's something that he wrote about um, with the assistance of John Turode, um, who provided the hardware engineering. Gary transferred um, the CPM program, and he wrote this in a simulator. Right, it was all simulated software um, from a paper tape onto a floppy disk. And, uh, and it worked the first time. I mean, that was just amazing that like, you know, he actually made this happen the first time. And at that moment, that um, the world talked to, the computer talked to the world via floppy disk, which in my mind is the very, very, the very birthplace of the personal computer. Um, thank you. I'm going to distribute uh, replicas of the IEEE milestone plaque to our speakers today, including to Scott and Kristen. If they could come up here for those as well. It's sort of alphabetical, I think. I see they. <laughs> It's sort of. <laughs> Somebody dropped the deck of cards. Uh, <laughs> we got the bees over at this end. The last one. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow. So these are glass <laughs> plaques with the words that are on the uh, bronze milestone plaque that's at 801 White House. 
to see everyone here for this recognition of such historic uh, contribution to the computer industry made right here in Pacific Grove by digital research Gary Kildall and a very significant team of people who participated in making that happen. I'm joined and I believe you probably met our mayor pro tem Robert Hewitt. Um, I just have to tell you my latest personal story got a new computer Two days ago, discovered I'm going to have to go out and upgrade the BIOS, and it's, it's bringing me flashes to uh, my earlier days in the computer industry when I spent a lot of time tracing interrupts through uh, assembly code uh, and what it did in the BIOS. But anyway, uh, a lot of great things have happened here. It's had a profound effect on the evolution of the computer industry, and I will turn it back at this point to uh, David Laws. Just a few words. Great. Uh, just, it's been so amazing. I, I think most of you, or a lot of you, were at the presentation earlier today, and either in person or on video. And it was just amazing to hear um, Gordon, Tom, David, John Orton, all those people who were talking about Gary's significant contributions and contextualizing them in a way that even I, his son, who had access to his memoirs and who had talked to him many times before he passed away, didn't know. And it's so touching that many, many people flew in from all over the place. And once again, I'd like to do um, a big thanks to all the DRI employees who came out today and were part of that great time. And one lasting legacy that all of us here in person and all the people whose lives that Gary touched, um, you know, we know that, that Gary passed away younger than he should have. and. He didn't get all the recognition in the industry they should have, but he's getting the recognition today that he should. And that legacy that we all know here in person, that we're experiencing today and now, we're going to carry through in our lives to the people that we touch. Thank you very much. I'm Tom Rolander, and I was uh, worked here at Digital Research in this building right here. And my office is up in the back corner up there, and we had a fantastic time, by the way, in this building. Um, just what I could say is that this is something that Gary would truly appreciate, would be this kind of celebration, because it's one among friends. He was a very collegial person and very social, and he had that social and warm aspect of him, and he also was an incredible inventor. So we're here today to celebrate his invention. It'll be unveiled here in the sidewalk. Thank you. Okay, so I want to remind everybody, as I often say, engineers literally invent the world that we live in, engineers and computer scientists. And IEEE likes to recognize the top engineers and computer scientists. And so this is the 139th milestone for IEEE for something that has really changed the world we live in. Thanks, Gary. Thank you, Howard. Just on the tape there. That's okay. right. And then here. Floppy disk on top. It is. Floppy disk on top. And the paper tape. I wonder what's on top. And he knows what's on top. We know what's on top. <laughs> <laughs> so, th this is uh, the way it was done before floppy disks. <laughs> and uh, Howard is going to read the inscription on the tape. Change uh -huh. oh. hands. <laughs> Okay, this may have been one of the most exciting days of my life 
Except, of course, when I visited Niagara Falls one day. <laughs> <laughs> so the favorite expression of Gary's that he uh, wrote in some of his work just after he uh, completed and booted up CPM for the first time. How perfect oh, so. it's raining, too. So <laughs> it is. It's perfect. Okay, maybe you can help me yep. there. Let's be waiting. Hey! Okay. Oh. Thank you, Hal.